Welcome, everyone. This is the Online Trust Alliance webinar on highlights of our 2016 Data Protection and Breach Readiness Guide. I'm Madeline Smith. I'm with OTA, and I'll be your host for this webinar. As a couple of housekeeping notes, we will have attendees on mute so that everyone can hear, and please feel free to ask questions using the chat feature. Uh, we'll be making a recording of today's session available along with a PDF of the deck on the OTA website. Today's session is also the first of a series of OTA webinars covering our new breach guide on topic-specific basis, so watch our website for further sessions on the event calendar as those come up. With me today are Craig Spiesel, who is our Executive Director here at OTA and President of OTA, along with Jeff Wilbur, who is Vice President of Marketing at Iconics and the OTA Chairman. With that, I want to do a quick overview of OTA itself, just to remind everyone who we are and our mission, particularly sharing our statement that we are, our mission is to enhance online trust and empower users while promoting innovation and the vitality of the internet. So our goals are about educating businesses, policymakers, and stakeholders in developing and advancing best practices and tools. We are a collaborative public-private partnership, and in particular, we are by design supported by a really diverse group of organizations, we, and all of these organizations committing to consumer control, innovation, best practices, and meaningful self-regulation. Now, 2016 marks the eighth edition of the Breach Guide, and this year's guide is more comprehensive than ever. We want to thank countless individuals who contributed time and feedback, input, expertise, advice to this year's publication. Uh, some of the ones we'd particularly like to call out, uh, even outside of our list of member, direct member companies, we have uh, outside organizations and associations such as the Privacy Rights Clearinghouse, Consumer Federation of America, but I especially want to thank our underwriting sponsors, Identity Guard, LifeLock, Symantec, and Verifine. Without them this year, the guide just would not have been possible. So thank you to our sponsors. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Jeff Wilbur to go through the 2016 Breach Report highlights. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, so I want to set the stage here by giving an overview. As Madeline mentioned, this is the eighth year that we've done the Breach Report, and it's grown every year. Uh, and I think this is the best edition yet. Um, looking at some of the highlights, uh, we found that numerically in the data that, uh, that jumped out at us is that 91% of the breaches that, were, that we analyzed last year were preventable. And we'll feel into that a little bit in, the, in a few slides. Uh, what we were after this year, and we changed some of the formatting to accomplish this, was really make the advice about data protection and preparation for such an incident uh, to be actionable. Um, and to do that, we reformatted a lot of the guides this year uh, in the form of checklists. You see some of these in the appendices. Uh, we also publish them separately so they can be used independently as handouts. So we have uh, checklists that go over risk assessment, both internally and for third parties. Oh, checklists. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in uh, listen-only mode. Jeff and Madeline. Um, All right, so take two. Welcome, everyone. This is the Online Trust Alliance webinar on highlights of our 2016 Data Protection and Breach Readiness Guide. My name is Madeline Smith, and I'm from OTA, and I'll be your host for this webinar. I have a couple of housekeeping notes. We'll have all attendees on mute so that everyone can hear clearly, but please feel free to send in questions using the chat feature. We will be making a recording of this session, and we'll make that available on the website along with a PDF of this presentation deck. And today's session is the first in a series of OTA webinars covering the new breach guide on a topic-specific basis. This is the highlights presentation, so watch our website for future uh, event listings of those future topic webinars. With me today 
are Craig Spiesel, our Executive Director and President of OTA, along with Jeff Wilbur, Vice President of Marketing at Iconics, and our OTA Chairman. And with that, I just want to take a moment to give a quick overview of OTA itself. So let me share our mission, which is to enhance online trust and empower users while promoting innovation and the vitality of the Internet. What we do is educate and develop and advance best practices and tools. We are a collaborative public-private partnership. We do benchmark reporting and meaning, we are backing meaningful self-regulation, best practices, innovation, and consumer control. We are a 501c3 tax-exempt charitable organization. We're global in focus and charter, and we're supported by fantastic companies. 2016 marks the eighth edition of the Breach Guide, and this year's is more comprehensive than ever, so we want to just take a moment to thank the countless companies, organizations, and individuals who provided hours of input, expertise, advice, and feedback. We are especially grateful uh, for some of the uh, nonprofit organizations that were able to partner with us on this. We want to call out the Privacy Rights Clearinghouse, Consumer Federation of America, but I especially want to thank our underwriting sponsors, Identity Guard, LifeLock, Symantec, and VeriSign for this year's guide, because without their support, this would not have been possible. And with that, I just want to hand it over to Jeff Wilbur for the 2016 Breach Report Highlights. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, so I want to set the stage here, uh, and Craig will peel into the details uh, a little later. Uh, but at a high level, we want to kind of look at what some of the highlights were uh, from this year's report. Uh, numerically, it stood out to us that 91% of the breaches that we analyzed through the first three quarters of last year were preventable, and we'll look at that in more detail in a moment. Um, the other main goal that we had this year was to make the advice actionable. We did that by reformatting a lot of the, the report, uh, including converting a lot of the narrative into checklists that can be used very easily in different areas. So these, they show up in the appendices largely, but we also publish them independently so they can be used by different groups in an organization uh, to walk through uh, things like risk assessment, both internally and for third-party services that might be used, uh, security best practices, the, the forensic do's and don'ts, uh, cyber insurance considerations, which is a new topic area this year, remediation service uh, guidelines and considerations, which is also a new area that we added this year, and a template to uh, interact with law enforcement to report incidents. So all of these are included uh, either in the report or as additional resources that can be used. Uh, and so we've enhanced it significantly. It grew by about 30% over previous years, and we think this is the, the, the best report we've had uh, to date. Looking at some of the key metrics, uh, we used a variety of sources to analyze the breach incidents that happened through the first three quarters of last year, and our intent is to update this in a few months when the final numbers for 2015 come in. Uh, we used uh, data from the Open Software Foundation on their Data Loss DB uh, website, uh, data from the Privacy Rights Clearinghouse, from Identity Theft Resource Center, and from Risk-Based Security. We did a lot of our own analysis to kind of blend these together and looked at uh, various aspects of uh, trends in breaches for last year. Uh, we found that there was a 29% increase in publicly disclosed breaches for the first three quarters. That's directly from risk-based security. Uh, our own analysis revealed the 91% of incidents that could have been prevented, and we'll look at those reasons on the next slide. Uh, we also did our own analysis to determine that about 30% of the breaches were due to lack of internal uh, employee controls, and we'll see some of those reasons on the next slide as well. As most of you know, last year, and it seems like every year it becomes the new year of the breach, uh, but An Anthem kind of led the way with nearly 80 million records being compromised. Uh, the Ponemon Institute has done analysis on the cost of a breach, and a lot of these can be hidden, and it's very difficult because a lot of breaches aren't publicly disclosed, but in the data they had available to them, they found that, and this is a global number, 
nearly $4 million cost per breach at about $150 per record. Uh, and of course, that can vary a lot because you can have a high overhead cost, even for a small breach, to do some of the remediation and forensics. Uh, and so the cost per record on the smaller breaches can actually be much higher. Another interesting point that we found in kind of looking at the angle of cyber insurance this year, which was new, uh, is that many companies were undercovered in their cyber insurance. We found uh, in our analysis that less than 50% less than had adequate coverage. Uh, and I think Craig will talk about that in a little more detail uh, later. So looking into this number of 91% of incidents that could have been prevented, and we look inside that, uh, where does that come from? And how did we reach that conclusion? Uh, the number one reason was actually not patching known or public vulnerabilities. Uh, uh, roughly a third of breaches uh, in our analysis happened for, from external, for like hacking, for instance. But most of those, the vast majority of those were preventable if uh, vulnerabilities had been patched. And these aren't vulnerabilities that showed up as a, almost a zero day or just, you know, the next week. These are well-known, established vulnerabilities that had the organizations been on a regular update schedule for their security protocols, um, they would have been able to patch against those hacks. Uh, another significant uh, cause for breaches were misconfigured devices and servers. And this goes to the point of keeping track of the latest uh, patches and protocols that are available uh, and kind of points out that you really need to keep pace with this and you can't, it's not a once and done kind of scenario. Uh, several of the breaches were caused by uh, data that was lost through, in, through laptops, through hard drives and so forth. Uh, but had that data been encrypted, uh, it could have been uh, still protected. Uh, there were other cases where the keys for encrypted data was actually disclosed, so those were preventable. Uh, using old systems, another reason. There are a wide variety of uh, causes that had to do with employees. Remember that 30% of these were due to employees. Uh, lost data, lost computers, uh, lost paper files. Uh, and much of this had to do with accidental disclosure, either by sending email to someone that it shouldn't have gone to, and thereby disclosing something outside the company, or accidentally posting on public sites. And then finally, uh, one of the major causes uh, for breaches that was preventable were, was this new category of business email compromise. And this is where you get a fake message from what looks like your CEO or your CFO instructing you to send uh, wire money to a, uh, an account somewhere for half a million dollars, multiple millions of dollars. And it's actually a fake message. It's essentially a phishing message uh, instructing you to do something. Uh, there are other exploits that are used in similar ways to cause employees to take action that either compromises passwords and internal systems or actually causes events like sending money outside the company. So when you add all this up, uh, roughly 90% of the uh, breaches were avoidable. And we've seen that uh, similar number over the last several years. It's always been in the kind of low to mid 90% range as, we've, as we have done our analysis. So if we, if we look over the past eight years, Madeline mentioned this is the eighth year, you know, we wanted to kind of summarize what we've learned, uh, both in preparing this report, interacting with companies uh, who are feeding into this uh, for the content, and also companies who've experienced breaches. Uh, and one of the main things we learn is that you really want to plan ahead, because the reality is if you don't, you're operating in an environment of pure chaos. Someone pulls the alarm when you get notified that a breach has happened, and usually that happens from outside your company. Uh, it's usually not discovered from the inside. And then everyone is going in every direction, not sure what to do. Uh, so this points out the whole plan ahead kind of nature uh, of data protection. So I want to walk through some of our, our key learnings. Um, so on page 10 of the uh, guide itself, and you'll see the, the page references on a lot of these slides. These are referring to the actual guide itself, if you're following along, uh, just for reference. Uh, we go through these points. 
Um, the first is that there needs to be an attitude change. Uh, rather than delegating data protection purely as an IT matter, uh, it needs to be embraced by the executive staff and all the key uh, members of the executive team. Because if a breach happens, it really gets everyone involved. Uh, salespeople have to deal with their customers. Uh, the marketing team has to deal with the communications uh, out to the world. The legal team will be heavily involved and so forth. So it's not just IT. Uh, and by planning at a high level, uh, the attitude of stewardship versus purely compliance can, can be kind of uh, instilled into the entire team. Uh, data itself needs to be recognized for its value in a company. And it's often the most... Uh, valuable asset that a company can have and thereby uh, the security that you apply to it needs to be commensurate with that value. Uh, as a corollary to that is that data should only be collected and retained if it has a business purpose. Um, then moving on to uh, back to kind of the team and what they should consider really need to wind forward and say, if, a, if an incident were to happen, what would be the consequences and what would we need to do about it so that everyone can be informed and engaged early and prepared in the case of an incident so that it's not a chaotic environment when it happens. Uh, as I've mentioned before, uh, for a lot of the preventable nature of these breaches that we saw last year, security and privacy evolve, uh, and therefore, it needs a regular check and continuous monitoring. Are we doing the right things in all these areas? And are there new rules or regulations? Are there new security protocols and methods, new attack vectors that need to be considered in our plan? Um, one of the big moves that we're seeing now is that security and privacy go well beyond the walls of the company itself. Uh, people are, are tapping into third-party services, cloud services more than ever. Uh, and there needs to be an understanding and an agreement with those third parties of how they handle security, how they report incidents, and to make sure that you have a common understanding of where the lines are on that. And then finally, back to the same point, being prepared is what it's all about. Um, being prepared with a plan and then training and kind of going through a mock exercise of, okay, if we have a breach, what happens here? Uh, who's going to do what, and make sure that everyone is well informed and engaged. Uh, it will help not only prevent the attack, but uh, if an incident were to happen, uh, it will equip everyone to respond very effectively and reduce the impact uh, of that incident, uh, and, and therefore maintain online trust and uh, reduce the impact on the business as much as possible. Hey, great. Um, Jeff, I appreciate you sharing that. And I think, you know, one thing that I want to get back to, uh, the report has a lot of information in it. Um, and one point that's not being revealed in the data is this business compromise exploits um, that are coming from not just email, but also from the malicious uh, advertising or malvertising. And um, maybe someone goes on mute real quick. What the uh, issue is, um, increasingly ransomware, targeting organizations, again, and that um, type of exploit and extortion is not making the, the headlines. It's not necessarily a breach from a legal standpoint, from uh, a consumer protection, increasing the, the that our research and working very closely with the Bureau on this, a huge upsurge in targeting of professional services firms uh, from everything from uh, accounting and architectural to law firms. And again, threatening to disclose client uh, data, or in the case of the recent engineering firm, uh, threatening to uh, destroy um, CAD drawings and what like. So the damage that they can do um, is being much more precise and they're targeting more companies. So again, um, the point here isn't about just consumer data, which is very concerning, but it's all types of data and IP, the crown jewels of a company. So uh, I want to jump into um, some of the risk assessment. And this is an area we're going to be having a follow-up webinar on specifically but in the guide, we, we touch on this in a few areas, uh, pages 11 through 13, and three major areas. Um, again, one is for your board and your officers and investors. Um, what they're looking at is a reinvestment of the uh, sustainability of corporation. 
the crown jewels. And so in this case, the crown jewels might be your client data. Um, it might be your, your proprietary information that can be compromised. Um, the internal risk is really looking at everything you're doing internal, uh, internally, excuse me, and can management really defend these that they are adopted in best practices, not only to help prevent the data from being compromised, but to detect it, be the compromise in progress, to contain it, and then respond and re remediate that. So it's careful, we want to be very careful and not victimize the victims, but also if you are a victim, you need to make sure that your practices are defendable. And that's very important, not only in public um, um, sentiment and public relations, but also in a court of law. The last, but I think perhaps growing part, and it's one of the reasons we use an image of a cloud and data breach, is it's beyond your walls today. More and more organizations are relying on service providers. The challenge is some of this are organized and some of them are unorganized. Um, in many cases, groups within a company um, are just going out and retaining. Uh, there's no formal review, so the relationship is, is unknown. Um, do we even know who they are? And one of the concerns are when they have an incident, what do they define it and what are their notification triggers back to you? Because ultimately, you are accountable for the data they have. And so if you don't understand their notification triggers, it's a real problem. So again, I encourage you to look at the checklist here. We're going to do a very thorough um, um, webinar focused on your service providers. And one of the mistakes that we find over and over, this is being done in the onboarding process, but the very least it should be done annually, if not semi-annually for cloud providers so you understand the, not only their, their, the, from the contract perspective, but what are they doing on the security side? What has changed? And that should be a collaborative discussion, not like an, um, the threat of an audit, but more of we want to understand. And again, I think that can help you and you can update that into your planning so you don't have that uh, confused chaos state that Jeff mentioned earlier. Um, we got to learn from mistakes. And uh, while this uh, illustration we all, this photo we all want to believe didn't happen of a uh, guy sitting in a pool with uh, a surge protector floating on flip-flops, um, I will tell you many of the breaches and we roll our eyes when we can't believe the lack of process in place of securing and protecting data or limiting access internally. Um, so we all need to learn from uh, each other here. And, you know, our belief is, uh, you know, very simple. Um, every company has some type of covered information. Uh, every company has some type of regulatory uh, oversight. They just may not know that. Um, you will have a data incident. Um, and if you're unprepared, it will cost you significantly here. So these are our OTA's laws of data, so to speak, here. And it's very important if you can recognize this, then how to, what can you do to help mitigate it? I'm not going to go through, I want to talk about security best practices. Um, as Jeff mentioned, as we've kind of peeled back the onion and analyzed many of these breaches or data loss incidences, they all of that 91%, we believe, can come back to these uh, 10 or 11 best practices. Uh, so first, you know, Jeff mentioned encryption. In, in several states and certain countries, if your data is encrypted to latest technology and you protected your key, it's not necessarily a breach. And I tell you, increasingly law uh, attorneys are saying that um, and even saying because the risk of harm if that data is encrypted uh, is negligible. And so I think it's a key point there. So is your data encrypted? Password management has been another area. Again, ability of reusing passwords, similar passwords or lack of passwords is a bigger challenge. Um, very concerning. Uh, we all have different opinions on the women law case, women ho uh, hotels, but again, password management was a key part of that. One of the areas I mentioned about is con containment, and there's a concept called least privileged user access, LUA, and what that really means is revalidating every employee's access to data that they have uh, within your organization. Quite often, we find people have moved. The challenge is quite often companies say, well, it's too hard to manage that, so they give everyone the same access. Well, that's great for ease of their job, but that makes it really easy for the criminal to come in, 
all they need to do is spearfish one employee and com uh, compromise everything. So again, um, re continue to review, review that. Um, one of the things that triggers that we've encouraged is work with HR. And so anytime someone is promoted or transferred to a different cost center uh, to force a reevaluation re of what they have access to. Um, that's both um, online security and physical security. Um, number four, I'm not going to go through each one of these for a time, but again, code reviews are very important. Uh, six is critical. We're again, this point of the spear phishing and companies increasingly are falling for spoofed emails and such. And we'll get into the insurance discussion of this. But again, if you're not checking this mail inbound, your employees are certainly at risk of, of falling for socially engineered exploits. Um, again, real-time monitoring is, is really important. Management of all IoT devices coming in, all these are critical areas um, and, and, uh, that are very important. Um, so the guide walks through here. And then one other one that, that's very, very important, um, which we'll get into is, is on the next slide here, is a vulnerability and threat intelligent program, uh, reporting program. Companies must have a process in place where third parties can report data to you and that you can appropriately respond to them. Uh, there is an initiative with NIST, uh, I'm sorry, NTIA, that we are working with others, a multi-stakeholder effort of putting these in place. Increasingly, these are uh, areas that are the courts and lawyers are looking at. Did you have a program in place to vet these? And as Jeff mentioned that increasingly companies find majority of these breaches are found externally. They come from someone like Brian Krebs in the media reporting and calling you on it. it comes from the FBI or the Bureau, uh, I should say, or the Secret Service as they are seeing other data and coming back to your IP threat. Or they're coming from a researcher. And the challenge is all too often the information coming from researchers is dismissed. It's coming to someone in the IT department. They're making a judgment call on it. And at the end of the day, um, that comes to forces sometimes some public disclosures. So you need to really look at this. How do you vet them? How do you respond to them? Because they can be those um, third parties can be your friends, but they can also turn from a white hat to a black hat very importantly here. So again, these are all key parts out there. Many of you are maybe aware of our IoT trust framework. Many of these uh, map out to those as well. I'm going to jump into this concept that we've been advocating for some time is data stewardship and what this really means. And so again, we're talking about security best practices, but really been thinking about the data you, you retain and hold and responsible data stewardship practices. And you need to look it through the life cycle. And so I encourage companies to really have this hard discussion as you're thinking about new business models, especially in the IoT world where we're seeing all these models thinking about a service and how we're going to um, mine the data. You need to think about the regulatory landscape, of the, and especially how you're going to acquire this data and if you have consumer choice and control. And so if you go around the spokes of this here, we think about this. What is your usage and access? How are you storing this? And then we continue people to encourage everyone to revalidate, validate, excuse me, the business purpose, key areas. And last but not least, data disposal. And as uh, some folks on the call may remember, recently Comcast had an issue on their data disposal. Um, it was actually in land landfill. Um, so they first got flagged, I believe, by the California EPA. Uh, for disposing computers in landfill, and then they found out that those hard drives still had customer PII data on that. So think very hard, how are you disposing the data? So it's not just the way you're uh, destroying a hard drive, but how are you actually disposing of that information as well? Um, and then mapping out to your stewardship program is then looking really through your whole data management program that you have, doing your risk assessment, Reevaluating your security protocols or process in place. And as Jeff mentioned, all too often it's employees and it's training and awareness. Um, and, you know, again, there's no patch for that, but education and oversight is really important. 
and monitoring all the way through there. And a company that can demonstrate that they have these things in place, they had a formal training program, um, but were still uh, penetrated and hacked, um, has a really good position in the media and, uh, and with um, the courts are really defending their status. So we're going to jump to another category here again uh, on our overview here today as the fundamentals of a plan. Um, and these directly come uh, from our work here in the Pacific Northwest with the Internet Crimes Task Force um, of the areas that we continually scratch our head. Um, companies that don't have designated first um, responders, people that are empowered, um, a formal notification tree. Because again, when that fire alarm is pulled, you want to know what to do. Um, companies that haven't developed a relationship with law enforcement in, in advance. And the motto uh, working between the service and the bureau is a call to one is a call to all. So call, make a contact. We have resources. We have some tools and wizards that are out there. Put your zip code in, your industry sector, and you can determine who within the FBI or if it's a secret service you speak with. Create a relationship with them uh, in advance. Uh, templates, training again, and uh, let regulatory review. And of course, just in the past 24 hours, the landscape with the EU has trained, changed dramatically. Um, there's still a lot of work to be understood there. And cyber insurance, which we'll talk on, um, and what's reasonable and not. So let's talk about cyber insurance. Um, OTA has been fortunate. We have uh, have had two major projects with uh, two of the largest companies that underwrite uh, commercial insurance policies. Um, and one of the biggest challenges is it's in its infancy. Cyber insurance is uh, rapidly growing. There's a lack of standardized taxonomy even within the industry. And of course, there's separate uh, state regulations and insurance regulations uh, at the state level. But in general, there are buckets of areas of um, companies want to think about. And we've actually created a guide. And again, our friends at Willis Towers and Watson, uh, one of the largest insurance companies in Hillcox Insurance, um, helped us provide this and develop this. So think about going through all these areas, what are covered. And one of the biggest areas and confusion out there is sometimes some director's policies, other policies have something about lost data, and they call that cyber insurance, um, but not necessarily dealing with all these specific areas. So I really encourage um, to get a professional walkthrough. Um, if it's not a separate policy or a separate addendum, you probably don't have um, a comprehensive or adequate insurance company uh, coverage. Uh, one of the last areas here is uh, potential for a claims denial, which is uh, negligence, and I should say willful neg negligence. And there's two major cases in the courts right now in which companies that fell for socially engineered exploits, um, in one case, uh, provided credentials um, and was deceived into thinking that the uh, person uh, on the email was actually uh, management and needed credentials, and they were provided. And again, that was willfully provided. The other scenario was where um, an executive, a CEO of a company was traveling. Um, they targeted, they knew that. They targeted his admin. They knew the admin had a sick cat based on Facebook. So it was able to be very personal and chummy in the communication and instructed her to do a wire transfer of $500,000 in which she did. Again, that was not a breach that we think about. It wasn't a hack. It was socially engineered. But again, the court is denying it. I should say the insurance company currently is denying it. So this is happening as a result of lack of terminology, lack of understanding, um, and what is adequate coverage. So I encourage you to look at that. We have all these in all these instances that I'm sharing and little factoids. We have links in our guide and, uh, for you to look at and, and see additional information. So communications is a really key part. So you've had a breach. You have a plan in place, and now you're going to communicate it. And I should say this is communication beyond that of your regulatory authority or beyond, beyond that of law enforcement. Um, those are unique um, areas. And I should also note communicating and notifying law enforcement does not necessarily trigger a notification to your regulatory authority. 
Um, as a matter of policy, the FBI will tell you that you need to check if you have regulatory oversight. So very important. That said, if you're looking at uh, you now have a breach, it's very important to understand these five or six segments you have to look at. And the important part here is how you do it, the tactic, your tone, the timing, and the technology is very key for your different messages. Your business partners or your board or your investors are best suited probably with a phone call. And the tone there is certainly going to be different than an email you send out to consumers. I should point the reason that we have the timing and the tone and tactic are pretty clear. Technology has increasingly become a problem for some companies who are now ready to send a communication out to 5 million people. What they find is two things. One is they don't have the capacity, so they bring on a new IP address or a new outbound mail server that is an unknown server. And what happens is that mail gets flagged or throttled by an ISP or gets junked. Because again, all of a sudden, millions of mail from an unknown sender. Um, we had a very specific one, and this happened with our friends at Target, is they actually brought on a new server recognizing that. But the server name, instead of Target.com, was BFI01. Well, BFI01 was the name of the prior uh, service provider, Bigfoot Interactive, that got acquired by another company and it was available server. So it met the technical requirements, but no one really thought about the user experience. And at the end of the day, more and more of their consumers thought it was a phishing email. So again, that kind of ended up um, back in their face and is a good example of not understanding um, being prepared. So again, key parts here. And again, we're going to be working on a specific uh, webinar on just the communications part here. But again, a lot in the book uh, to pull from. So jumping from there to remediation, and um, I have some personal opinions on it. Right now, um, and I see some experts uh, on the call here have joined us. Um, and in fact, there's been a race to the bottom on remediation services. Uh, companies are estimating and, tr uh, and trying to pitch uh, service providers and trying to get the lowest possible bid as possible. So it means they cut services and race to the bottom. And reality is, I, I think consumers are getting inundated with these notices and not sure what they can do. Or what happens when they find a credit card or credit inquiry has been made. So we're really advocating this concept of more uh, ID theft counseling, case managers type. Um, and there's many community-based organizations that are out there. And we're really encouraging companies that have a breach to really significantly consider not just doing the, the, the notification that's required and monitored by regulators, but really think behind that. Think about working with a community-based organization, thinking about providing a grant to them, because really, you know, it will benefit everyone, your reputation, the impact of parties, and clearly, if you are uh, on the receiving side of a class action suit, you clearly can show that you've gone above and beyond. So that's an area that we feel very strongly and very important to do. And as you can see here that, again, um, consumers um, clearly, you know, they don't know what to do. They've already had 10 of these, and they're in this state of uh, uh, the, uh, numb, uh, numbness and such in here. And so this level of uh, distrust and concern about their digital information is, is certainly increasing. So as we're looking um, – as we talk about the communication side, it's also very important to understand the regulatory landscape. And the big issue we have that we find continually over and over is companies aren't aware of where their consumers reside. So um, this, as we know in the US, there's 46 different state uh, regulations on data breaches. Um, if that consumer moves to Canada, again, you have to comply where the consumer resides, where they have a nexus. Uh, Australia is dusting off their regulations right now, and New Zealand's made some updates. So internationally, this is an evolving landscape. Since the first of the year, Washington State, Connecticut, and some other states have updated the regulations. So it's very hard to understand this. Um, so again, knowing where they reside, and by doing that uh, periodically, in general, it's believed if you uh, inquire and ask consumers to update their profile twice a year, you're in pretty good shape uh, to do that. So uh, I'm not going to get into all the issues that have come out with Safe Harbor, but the EU-US um, privacy shield is rapidly evolving. 
and I will tell you the Article 29 working group is in the midst of reviewing this right now. Um, so there are some things that may evolve and very quickly change about uh, the EU um, and position on here. Um, I don't purport to have a comprehensive understanding today, but we are planning a follow-up webinar very specific to this area. And there's lots of news that is coming um, over uh, the wires as we speak. Um, I guess some of the key things to think about on a regulatory landscape depend upon where a consumer resides. It may be more of an opt-in versus opt-out. Um, increasing request of honoring do not track. Um, reasonable security definitions and such. So these are all key issues. And again, more to speak, speaks to understand where your consumers are and having a, um, a real good pulse on that uh, situation. So we've covered a tremendous amount here, and Maddie and Jeff shared different parts of this. Um, I think there's several areas that we think that are immediately actionable, and then we'll take some questions here. Um, so again, uh, I, I think some of the simple things you can do within your organization is identify the data owners. Um, who are responsible for that data uh, on the business side? Um, attempt to identify external, external service providers. If you don't have those on a list, you probably need to go to every functional group um, and make sure you have a, cool, a full understanding. And I also encourage you within this next week to pick up the phone, and this is a simple call, and find out who within the FBI should be your contact, or at least um, if there's a special phone number. So again, um, getting those things identified up front. And as we move forward, the 90-day scenario, uh, and these are uh, these are challenging um, and aggressive objectives, but complete your external assessment. Um, very important. Um, obviously, if you don't know who they are, you can't do the assessment. So obviously, the first week is very important. Um, and look at those privacy and security investments. And one of the questions is, really articulate what is the business need of that and the business risk to a company. Um, all too often, they've been written in uh, IT speak that really doesn't really communicate up to the board level why those are the imperatives behind some of those investments. And one of the others that I really highly encourage companies to do is um, bring in uh, a forensics uh, firm, have a retainer with them, have a, them do a preliminary audit of your, your processes. Uh, they may identify logging that's incorrect, uh, some other areas. Having them know your architectural footprint is very valuable, um, and they will help them immensely when they come into a breach uh, scenario. So the goal is within six months, you will really have all this done. You will have updated your data breach guide, and you will be in a position to make security and privacy part of your value, value proposition. So I encourage you to think about that. And we have time left here, and Matty, I'd like to kind of go to um, really um, – some of the questions that have come in. Yeah, I, I do have a few here for you, Craig. Thanks. Um, one of the questions that came in was on the topic of that issue that Jeff touched on about so many breaches being uh, related to employee action, whether intentional or accidental. And do you have any advice about resources for strong employee training programs or how to, how to mitigate that? So I'll, I'll give that one to Jeff. <laughs> But, uh, I don't know any, training. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I know of any singular place to go for that, but um, you know, some of it has to do with training of just good good data uh, practices, uh, and and other has to do with policies of how that's treated. For instance, the you know the encryption issue. Um, if data is encrypted and and lost, it's not as big a deal as as if it's not, obviously. Um, and that there are protections and controls that can be put in place. Uh, obviously, there's the balancing act, uh, because if you put uh, too many restrictions on employees, all they do is work around it, and you'll, you'll never know that it happened. Um, so it, it clearly is a balancing act there. Hey, Jeff, I might add on that. Uh, I mentioned earlier, um, about the challenge of employees bringing devices. Um, and, and one of the challenges that we have is, let me have this echo again. Let me see if we can fix this. 
Um, one of the challenges is BYOD, bring your own devices, and more IoT devices coming into a workplace. And what we really encourage is setting up a totally isolated guest network. Because if you don't do that, the employees will figure out a way to get credentials and get on your network. And so if you have this totally isolated, is one way to contain that from anything else. And if, if you're a small business, I encourage you to really think very hard about um, your, your router because some of the uh, low price point routers and hubs or routers uh, aren't totally isolated. So you want to have a totally isolated circuit and they're so inexpensive, it's not that hard to have a, a parallel network in there. So again, uh, contain the problem. Great. Um, I, now I have a question that is uh, about the um, comment, Craig, that you were making about um, uh, keeping up on known vulnerabilities. Can you discuss a little bit about challenges and best practices for how to keep up on it and how to make sure you're managing against uh, these risks that are even known out there? Well, that's a hard, uh, a hard thing and it's a challenge for anyone. The reality is um, Typically, it's the cyber criminals aren't taking advantage of the, the zero-day exploit that just comes out yesterday. Um, typically, what we find is the vulnerabilities have been out uh, close to 45 days um, that are being exploited. So some of the simple tools um, I encourage is, is continuous scanning. And so uh, two things in place. One, um, review your logs and making sure that you are logging for at least six months of data preferably 12 months, and make sure you're able to digest and decode the logs. Um, there are tools out there, but sometimes the logs are in a proprietary format. Uh, so that's really to help to see what's going on. Uh, the patching part, again, um, we've worked with a few companies, one high-tech bridge in, in Geneva, uh, of an up-to-date SSL testing tool to continually monitor and help flag those. So there are tools out there. Um, you also can look in on automatic updates on devices and systems. Um, so there are resources, but this is a, a challenge as we become more and more com um, reliant. Um, and also, as I mentioned earlier, um, just because you have an outside firm do, doing it, it doesn't mean that you don't have responsibility. So you should be asking those same questions to your outside cloud providers as part of your review process. Thank you. And this one comes um, with a bit of an international spin, and it says, can you speak to potential impacts OTA has identified regarding the TPP and privacy? Well, actually, I'm not 100% sure on, on that question. Yeah, but, just... you know, impacts, risk impact statements are very, very important. Um, and um, every uh, country is, is evolving right now. And so, um, the, it's an evolving landscape, so uh, I'm not sure what the specifics are. Maybe um, the uh, question could kind of uh, clarify that as follow we're speaking. Up. A follow up, if not, we can take it offline there. I'm going to go to another one that I had in here, um, which is uh, just Craig and your crystal ball. What kind of trends, risk trends, are you seeing more of or do you expect for the rest of this year coming in 2016, what's rising, but also do you see any types that are fading? Well, you know, I, I guess it's, um, you know, we're going to continue to see credit card skimming uh, scenario. Um, I saw a few things come up on the radar just today, some other companies that are being exploited. I'm not sure it was Dairy Queen or someplace, um, and I probably shouldn't be saying it, um, but we're going to continue to see those. But I think what's happening is the sophistication and that the criminals are increasingly are data mining um, and understanding the value of the data. And instead of right now, to a certain amount, it's been a crime of opportunity um, to be much more precise and targeted. Uh, obviously, Sony from two years ago was very precise, but that was more driven from hacktivism. But now we're seeing that same approach being taken by the cyber criminals to identify those high net worth targets. So again, and not just for consumer data. And one of the things that we've, we've learned is that the payback uh, and the ability of walk away with large sums of cash very quickly 
um, by targeting a large firm that doesn't want the public ridicule and embarrassment of their professional data or their systems being compromised. Um, caving into ransomware um, is it turning out to be a very lucrative business. Um, and especially in the scenario of the pressure where you literally have a, a countdown clock locking on your systems, threatened to um, uh, erase all of your data. Um, and that urgency um, does not lend itself for forensics, uh, does not lend itself to bringing in law enforcement at times. Um, now, obviously, the official position from the FBI is uh, not to pay it. Uh, one of the questions that comes up all the time is uh, how do we know if we pay it, they will actually um, um, uh, remove it. And effectively, there's honor within thieves. Um, they understand and self-police. If they don't, um, they can't continue to extort money from people uh, if they don't believe that the encryption will be taken off from them, or I should say the destruction ransomware. So very important. On the other hand, once you begin made as a target, you are going to be comp uh, focused on again. So the importance of, of immediately uh, securing your system so it doesn't happen again because they also will identify you as a soft target and others were more than happy to follow suit. And I have one more question here about uh, the topic of uh, your point about getting an attitude change. So the most important or the top uh, learning was changing the attitude. Do you have any advice about how I can get my executives to support this inside my organization? Well, short, short of a taser, I'm not sure at times, but you know, <laughs> it, in all reality is it gets back to that risk appetite. And I think that there has been a sea change in the executive suite. It's no longer considered an IT issue. And again, understand the whole point of what's a business risk. And it's a business interruption. It is the, uh, the crown jewel aspect of it. And again, um, you know, certainly for public companies, there is a significant amount of responsibility and accountability for them to be doing this risk assessment. I also have seen and gone through and, and spoken to some of my peers, uh, CISOs, and, you know, I've given some coaching because the way they've written their documents talk about uh, internet protocols and we'll get a 6% performance and we'll be able to solve this potential risk. And nothing's in there articulating the business value and business need. So we need to make sure we can convey, communicate that to the business need so executives can be looking at that. Great. Well, that... Actually, I, I see one other question coming up was about forensics companies, and uh, I think the, the question is about the legality of it. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that with what, what I think the question was. Um, the importance of forensics companies, if they find and discover certain things, uh, that could be admissible and discoverable um, under uh, a subpoena and such. That said, unless your outside counsel retains them, and un unless everyone honors and understands what's considered attorney-client privilege or AC privilege, um, one of the other mistakes companies sometimes do is in the heat of this, a lot of very vocal emails get sent around that are um, not necessarily accurate, but also become very damning. And so I encourage companies, first of all, create that relationship with a forensics company in the first place, um, have that, make sure it's under and retained through your legal counsel. And if you are dealing with a breach, recognize anything you put in email can be accountable on, in a court of law. Um, and there's very few exceptions that are what's called AC privilege. I see that happen over and over. Uh, I sent a mail to Maddie. Well, she's not my attorney. And even though I may be an attorney, it may be not be appropriate. And so it has to be a very specific uh, definition on what falls into that. And I encourage companies to have that understanding so when they provide, they have a breach, that their communications um, are understood and somewhat protected. So hopefully that answers that question. <laughs> Great. Well, I want to thank everyone here. I know we're coming up to, uh, we are at the top of the hour here. Um, as Maddie mentioned, we have a series of webinars coming up. Um, we'll be announcing them. They'll be at our site. 
Um, this deck, as well as a recorded webinar, will be posted by end of day tomorrow. So I encourage you to have there. I encourage you to link. Uh, the other point that are coming up is we will be updating this. As, uh, as Jeff mentioned, that the data and our analysis was through the, uh, September of 2015. Uh, hopefully by April we'll have an update to reflect all year-end data. And if you have suggestions or comments, we certainly welcome those. Um, one last thing here that I did want to show here is uh, this just got announced this week. The UK um, uh, Information Commissioner's Office has a self-assessment wizard of sorts. I encourage you to kind of think about that. That's a tool to help, again, um, specific for UK, but I think it's very applicable for anyone in the EU and anyone that wants to comply. And I think it also will map out to um, uh, probably meet and exceed from US and certainly be uh, consistent with some of the expectations in, in Australia. So I want to encourage that there. So um, again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Here's the contact information. Uh, I want to thank Jeff and Maddie. Uh, uh, for their work on the report here, and everyone who's been part of this process, our sponsors, our, our members, and the other organizations. So thank you very much, and until uh, next time, uh, have a, a safe day. Thank you.